Kylie Minogue exploded onto the music scene in 1987 and has not only become a chart-topping, multi-award winning global artist over the past two decades, but also a fashion icon, designer, actress and philanthropist. The Aussie superstar has achieved worldwide record sales of more than 70 million and has received notable music awards, including multiple Brit Awards and a Grammy Award. I think Kylie's legacy is that you can be famous, you can be successful, and you can still have a good time. Kylie is up there with the greats uh, in the music industry. I mean, she's often compared to Madonna, and, and while you might call Madonna the queen of pop, she's definitely the princess of pop. In 2011, Kylie Minogue was inducted into the Australian Recording Industry Association Hall of Fame. Her first single, The Locomotion, spent seven weeks at number one on the Australian singles chart and became the highest selling single of the decade in Australia. I mean, there's a huge back catalogue of, of records that are played over and over again that she's left to us. Um, she definitely won't be forgotten anytime soon. And what's really exciting about her, I think, for all of the fans and for the press and for everybody else that knows her, is um, she has got so much life left in her. You know, just when you think, oh, maybe Kylie's going to take a few years out, she comes back with a pop belter. Fundamentally, she's a happy person. Fundamentally, she smiles and she brings joy to a lot of people. And she's never tried to shy away from that. With massive chart-topping singles such as Spinning Around and Can't Get You Out of My Head, she has given the pop world a multitude of classic hits that will be played in clubs for years to come. Follow the incredible story of one of pop music's leading ladies. Get ready for showtime. Australian television film and music star has captivated the world with her staggering capacity for reinvention and captivating iconic pop songs. First introduced as Charlene, a lovable young mechanic on the Australian television soap Neighbours, she moved on to an outstanding and iconic music career, throughout which she also gained enormous public support and respect during her highly publicized battle with breast cancer. I think being a journalist on Fleet Street at the time when it was announced that Kylie had cancer, it was literally like, oh my God, you know, you don't ever think that's going to happen to somebody like her. She's an international star, she's a real hard worker and she's just so nice, you know. It's that classic case of it will happen to someone else um, and it hit everybody really, really hard. But I think what we all learned from her cancer episode was the fact that she's a grafter. You know, this wasn't someone that was going to sit down and, and really play the victim. This was a girl that was going to get back up, she was going to get back on stage, and she was going to show us exactly what she was capable of. Um, and it was complete, it was so commendable how she handled it. She spoke out for a number of charities. You know, she really was that kind of poster girl for this might happen to you in your life. Cancer might strike you, but you can get back. You can turn your life around and you can get through it. Um, and she proved that when she went back on stage with Showgirl. In March 2014, Kylie released her hugely anticipated 12th studio album titled Kiss Me Once. It was her first album since 2010 and her first under the management of Jay-Z's Rock Nation. Upon the album's release, Kiss Me Once was met with divided reviews from music critics, many of whom complimented Minogue's return to mainstream dance music and felt the album lived up to expectations. Into the Blue was the album's debut single and eventually managed to hit number one on the U.S. Hot Dance Club Songs chart. Kylie's 12th studio album was called Kiss Me Once and in this uh, record there was the song um, Into the Blue. This is a great catchy tune. We see a very glamorous and sophisticated Kylie who's coming back from a party and at a party. She has great hair in this video and once again we see her in that ever-present leotard although it is draped with a certain amount of sequins and, and lace. I think, you know, what we see in this 
incarnation of Kylie is what we have really grown to love. It's a sophisticated ingenue, it's a very sexy bit of punch, and it's a fun, upbeat song as we've come to love from Kylie. Kylie Minogue's career has spanned over 20 years. With her chart-topping music, she has faced some extreme highs, and with her fight against breast cancer, some extreme lows. To understand the incredible journey she's been through, we have to go back to where it all started. Anne Minogue was born on May 28, 1968, in the sunny city of Melbourne, Australia. She's the oldest child of Ronald Charles Minogue, an accountant of Irish descent, and a Welsh mother, Carol Ann, a former dancer from Maystag, Wales. Kylie is the oldest of three children, born between 1968 and 1971. Her brother Brendan is a news cameraman in Australia, while her younger sister Danny Minogue is also an extremely successful pop star. The Minogue children were raised in Surrey Hills, Melbourne, and educated at Camberwell High School. From a very young age, both Kylie and her sister Danny, her younger sister, were really pushed into the spotlight. Uh, they both had aspirations to be uh, singers and actors, and they both started very young. Kylie was only 11 years old when she first started making television appearances on Australian soap operas. I think the charm of Kylie Minogue is she was really the girl next door. She was the girl that you literally could have at the end of your garden, um, and she could be your friend. She was friendly, she was cute, there were the perm, she she tied up her little uh, her little shirt. She had the pull-up jeans. She was she was pretty much the golden girl of Australia. And I think from the get-go, the UK just took her into their hearts. The Minogue sisters began their careers as children on Australian television. At age 12, Kylie appeared in small roles in soap operas such as Skyways and The Sullivans, before being cast in one of the lead roles in The Henderson Kids. Having a strong desire to succeed in the music industry. Kylie made a demo tape for the producers of the weekly music program Young Talent Time, which featured Danny as a regular performer. But really it was Danny who was the big star at the beginning. Danny was appearing on a, a big television show in Australia where she was singing and she was acting. And, and Kylie, although she was eventually invited to perform on the show, was not invited to be a regular cast member. So for a long time while they were children, despite the fact that Kylie was the oldest of the three Minogue children, she was really in the shadow of her sister's career. Danny's success was overshadowing Kylie's acting achievements until Kylie was cast on the soap opera Neighbors in 1986 as Charlene Mitchell, a schoolgirl turned garage mechanic. When Kylie landed the role in Neighbors, this was the beginning, really, of her career. It, it launched her into the stratosphere in terms of fame. Prior to that, she'd really been in her sister Danny's shadow, but once she landed the role of Charlene in Neighbors, she became a household name, not just in Australia, but also in the UK, where the show had become very, very popular. The show was pretty much a phenomenon. You know, it really worked in, in Australia, but the UK immediately opened their arms and took it on board as well. She was playing a real tomboy, the mechanic of Ramsey Street. She was up to no good all the time, and I think all of us just fell in love with her as soon as she got on that show. I remember rushing home from school to watch it as a teenager. All my friends went, did the same thing. And she uh, played Charlene, the mechanic, um, and her, her character was massive in the show. I mean, it was all about the relationship um, with Charlene and Scott and um, that wedding. They got married in 1987 on the show, attracted 20 million viewers in the UK, which is phenomenal. That's such a huge figure. You don't get that kind of figure in UK TV anymore. I think everybody was a fan of Neighbours in the 80s. You know, I was of that generation. I'm in my mid-30s now, and I think we all grew up with the Scott and Charlene years. It was an actual era that we all grew up in. Um, and I think everybody still looks back at that with Neighbours, for sure, as that being the gl glory days of that particular soap. Kylie's um, romance with Jason Donovan, which occurred both on and off screen, really launched her into the stratosphere. There was such an incredible interest in her as an individual, but also in her relationship with Jason and their, um, their, their friendship, their love affair. All of that became very, very much tabloid fodder at the time. During a benefit concert with other members of the Neighbours cast, 
Kylie performed the locomotion. This led to an offer of a recording contract with Mushroom Records in 1987. Like a lot of singers, Kylie's beginning kind of happened uh, in a way that was completely unexpected. Kylie got a record deal off on the, uh, really by chance. She was at a charity benefit and she was performing with the rest of the neighbors cast just for fun. In fact, she sang I Got You Babe with John Waters who was also on the show. And as an encore, kind of almost an afterthought, got up and sang Locomotion. Well, there was such a reaction from the crowd, which absolutely loved it, that she signed a record deal the next day and actually went on to record that song, Locomotion, which became a massive number one best selling hit for her. It's just funny that she didn't intend to get this record deal in that way. She was having a laugh. She was at a charity benefit. There was certainly no sense of an audition about it. And yet, it was the, the spirit of that performance, her obvious talent, the fact that she always wanted to sing that obviously came through and got her that deal. So the video to Locomotion was fantastic because it was just absolutely quintessentially 80s. Um, everything about it was 80s, from the gold hoop earrings, um, Kylie's obviously perms, frizzy hair, she wore rara skirts, she wore the kind of Jane Fonda workout type of gear that we used to sing in the 80s. There was graffiti everywhere. Um, it was just fantastically sort of a slice of 80s pop like you've never seen before. The video for Locomotion is really interesting when you compare it to modern day pop videos. You look at someone like Rihanna or Beyonce and they're in a bodysuit and it's all about the crotch area. And then you look at this locomotion and it's so innocent and sweet and naive. In fact, when Kylie shakes her hips, the camera is actually up at her face. You never actually even see her hips shaking except from a very wide shot. It's a completely innocent, pure, sweet bubblegum video. And I think it really kind of set the tone for Kylie's image in the early years. This was a very um, young girl and the fact that Kylie's so small in stature actually makes her look even younger than she was. So there was a real sweetness about this image that she put forward. Absolutely nothing sexy or uh, provocative. That would come later. music producers Stock, Aitken and Waterman were so impressed by the Australian beauty that they decided to make her a star. Her string of successful hit singles took off with the release of I Should Be So Lucky from her debut album Kylie. Well, I, I, at that time I was uh, running a distribution company, a music distribution company, but all the time, uh, gro you know, growing really commercially and in a way looking for opportunities to get into more into the mainstream and that was coinciding with uh, the Stock Aiken and Waterman production rise that was going on uh, in another part of London but eventually they said uh, all right we're going to uh, try try this idea and we'll make a record on the newly formed PWL Pete Waterman Limited label and that came to us and uh, that was the uh, it, it girl Mandy Smith and it, it was pretty difficult and uh, um, you know I actually really I, to be honest didn't go too well so so I, I, I was kind of begging PWL then to try us with a, another record and their general manager uh, called me for lunch and I, I went to lunch and uh, he had arrived with um, uh, Simon Cowell and they were they're very excited and they were saying to me don't worry about you know what's gone on with Mandy and whatever because now we're going to dish up the, this is this is your moment you know you're going to get the big one you know and I went oh, great uh, and, they, and they came up with this name Kylie Minogue so they pl played the record which was um, I should be so lucky and uh, we put, then put it on the phones. Our, our mission was then to sell it into retail, and, and they didn't want it. And I started to think, that, you know, this record is not, you know, it's not going to be a hit. It's not going to happen. 
I, I was then in, in Cannes, uh, uh, the, if you like, the record version of the Cannes Film Festival. Uh, and I was sitting there with uh, with Simon Cowell, who, who was also going through a fairly bad time, and he was saying to me, how's it going, George? I said, well, it's going pretty badly. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think we're dead in the water, actually, with it. Uh, I, I, I came back from Cannes, I got I into my car at um, Gatwick, uh, and, the, and the driver had the uh, Radio 1 on, and uh, and I remember, and he was saying, he was saying, what a great week it's been for international female artists. You know, we we've got this uh, phenomenal uh, young lady from Australia. Uh, this is Kylie Minogue, and I should be so lucky. On the radio, I was sitting in the back of this car going, oh my God, this is our record. Uh, and of course, that changes that changes the mood, that changes everything. And and that record ju just went, uh, you know, five thousand. 50,000, 500,000, and and suddenly it was it was number one, it, and it was the biggest selling record, not by our standards, by anybody's standards. It was just gigantic. It was, it, you can't explain how big that record was, and and in a way that was you know that was kind of where she came into my life, you know, <laughs> and I and I met her and I recognised. Uh, immediately, the, al although she was she was this tiny waif like you know um, pop star then, but she had a, a dynamic about her, a, a really um, you know po pointed head on. She re really did understand uh, what she was doing. The music video for I Should Be So Lucky is really um, amateurish if you compare it to music videos today. It's like a one camera, you see her in different positions in the room, a couple of outfit changes, but again, it's very sweet and very innocent. Kylie Minogue has been um, uh, compared to Marilyn Monroe because even when she's being provocative, there's a sweetness and an innocence about her. In I Should Be So Lucky, you can really see that innocent, sweet side of Kylie Minogue. Even when she's sitting on a bed in a nightdress, what looks like a nightdress, she still seems miles away from being in any way provocative. Again, there's a real sweetness to her when you see her in that strapless dress in the video. She actually looks so thin and tiny. She almost looks childlike. It certainly looks like a teenager in this video. So I think that again, you know, we're seeing the beginnings of Kylie's career. It's a very catchy, upbeat song. It's a great video, but it's very simple and it's very much the innocent beginnings of her career. I think the video for I Should Be So Lucky was one of those iconic moments for, for every pop fan. We were watching her in the bath with the bubbles blowing around and, you know, it was very mincy, wasn't it? It was obviously really cleverly aimed at the gay market and what was really interesting was there was a time when she wasn't really that welcoming about the fact that she'd been with Stock, Stock Aiken and Waterman for, the, for that long. Uh, but recently on the, on the Kiss Me Once tour, she revisited that and she recreated the bar scene. And I think everybody kind of went, actually, that's really cool. You know, to go back and go, yeah, it was cheesy, it was pop, blah, blah, blah. You know, Pete Waterman was telling me to do this, that and the other. But it was kind of cool, and we, we want those memories, because we all grew up with them. The song, I Should Be So Lucky, has an interesting story about its beginning. Kylie had gone to the UK to have a very important meeting with a record label, but actually they forgot that she was coming, they really didn't have her on their radar, and while she was waiting outside the studio to take the meeting, they actually composed the song, I Should Be So Lucky. So when Kylie walked into the meeting and she got signed to the label, they told her, we've already got your first song. Everybody around the globe was talking about this person. Meanwhile, she was obviously on Neighbours as well, having a you know a full-time TV job thrown into the pop world. Um, it was hard for her, you know, she was having to juggle a lot, and that overnight success was something that she seemed to easily just sail into. Um, and I think it kind of started the ball rolling for a career which she's really never really stopped doing. You know, she's carried on, work's been a big ethic all the way through. She doesn't want to just float through the industry. She's going to work 
hard to get where she wants to get. And this was an album of really dance-oriented pop tunes. Now this album did really well, particularly in the U.S. It went to gold. This was the first time for Kylie to have a gold selling record in the U.S. And the single The Locomotion hit the top of the charts. The album also did incredibly well in the U.K. It spent more than a year on the U.K. album charts, including several weeks at number one. Kylie's fame was growing to a global scale. Follow-up singles from the album sold well, including Got To Be Certain, her third consecutive number one single on the Australian music charts. Towards the end of 1988, Kylie left Neighbours to focus on her music career. Kylie also collaborated with her then-boyfriend and Neighbours star, Jason Donovan, for the song Especially For You. It peaked at number one in the UK and sold almost one million copies. Kylie's second album, Enjoy Yourself, was released in October 1989. The album was a success in the UK, Europe, New Zealand, Asia and Australia. The album spawned number one singles, Hand on Your Heart and Tears on My Pillow. Despite the album faring well in many countries, it failed to sell well throughout North America and Kylie was dropped by her American label Geffen Records. After the release of her second album, Kylie decided to return to her acting roots and went on to star in the film The Delinquents in 1989. The movie was poorly received by critics, but it proved popular with audiences. In the UK, it grossed more than two million pounds, and in Australia, it was the fourth highest grossing local film of 1989 and the highest grossing local film of 1990, proving that Kylie was a popular movie star as well as a pop star. Kylie's third album, Rhythm of Love, was released in November 1990. The album presented a more sophisticated and adult style of dance music and also marked the first signs of her rebellion against her production company team. Kylie was really one of those artists that started off so clean cut. So I think when Rhythm of Love came out, it was a real chance for her to, a bit like what Miley Cyrus has done recently, remind everyone that she was growing up. You know, she was getting into her early 20s. She wanted to start being a bit more adventurous. The outfits were shorter, there were the hot pants, there was the, the Better the Devil You Know video. Everything was getting a little bit raunchier. We weren't seeing a full-blown, you know, sexual Kylie erupting, but what we were seeing was her starting to, you know, work out what kind of a woman she was gonna be as she, as she developed. Determined to be accepted by a more mature audience, Kylie took control of her music videos, starting with Better the Devil You Know, and presented herself as a sexually aware adult. It was quite a different sound for her. She was obviously moving away from the poppy sound, and her look was a more sexy kind of look, um, but it wasn't quite as successful as the first two albums, probably because she was moving away from that pop princess that her fans loved and experimenting a bit more. Um, one of the biggest hits from that album was Better the Devil You Know, um, and in the video you see her looking a lot more sexy. I mean, in one of the looks she's flashing a lot of midriff, um, she's got straightened hair, she's really sort of playing up to the camera being sexy. She's wearing a black dress in another look with the shoulder strap sort of falling off her in a sexy way. Um, so this is kind of a new Kylie emerging um, who's more in touch with her sexuality. You can see her uh, beginning to try to change her image and try to show the world that she's very much a sexual being and she's very much grown up. And of course around that time she was dating Michael Hutchins who arguably was the love of her life. Um, she's recently said that she still loves him and um, he, he was obviously a strong influence on her career at that time. Dating Michael Hutchins was also seen as a departure from her earlier persona. I mean, people who thought of Kylie as someone who would be well matched with Jason Donovan might have been slightly surprised to see that the next big name she was attached to is someone who's completely different in terms of public image. Michael Hutchins at that time was like sex on a stick. So to be associated with him really changed the public perception of Kylie as well. Now in terms of Rhythm of Love, it sold well in Europe and in Australia. She then later embarked on the Rhythm of Love tour in February 1991.
Kylie's fourth album, Let's Get To It, was released in October 1991, and it reached number 15 on the UK Albums Chart. It was her first album to fail to reach the top 10. While the first single from the album World Is Out became her first single to miss the top 10 of the UK Singles Chart, subsequent singles If You Are With Me Now and Give Me Just A Little More Time reached the top 5 respectively. At this point in her career, Kylie had fulfilled the requirements of her contract and elected not to renew it. She later expressed her opinion that she was stifled by her producers, Stock, Aitken and Waterman, claiming that she felt like a puppet. Kylie's fourth album, Let's Get To It, really shows that she's starting to feel unhappy at her record label. There's something that comes through this album, uh, which is uh, reflective, I think, of how she says now she felt at the time, which was like a puppet being pulled on the strings by her record producers at the time, who were uh, Stock, Aiken, and Waterman. You can tell she's not totally excited about this record, and in fact, it was the only one of her records up to this point that didn't make it into the top 10. I think there was something about this project that from the beginning was a bit doomed. Kylie knew she wanted out of her contract and she knew that she was unhappy, but she was obligated to make this fourth album, so she did it. But there's not the same kind of joy and excitement in this project that you can feel on some of the others. I think for Kylie it was quite important that she spent all of her kind of formative years with Stock Aitken and Waterman and she realised that you know she did want to go outside the line. When she was with the, the guys producing it was you're doing this, you're staying in this bracket, don't move outside it. But let's be honest, she's Kylie Minogue, she wanted to paint outside that line. Um, so she left, she got up and she went no, I've got to do something different um, and that was a big deal for her because I think that really formed where she was going and, and how she was going to experiment with her career. That's when Deconstruction Records came along and it was all about her having a sexual awakening um, and realising that she was a, a strong woman and she wanted to be in control of her career. Kylie was now gaining more media coverage than ever and was signed to a new record deal with Deconstruction Records. Her latest record deal was highly touted in the music media as the beginning of a new phase in her career. Her fifth album, titled Kylie Minogue, was released in September 1994 and managed to sell well in Europe and Australia. The lead single, Confide in Me, spent four weeks at number one on the Australian singles chart. The next two singles from the album, Put Yourself in My Place and Where Is the Feeling, reached the top 20 of the UK singles chart while the album peaked at number four on the UK Albums Chart, eventually selling 250,000 copies. Movie director Stephen E. D'Souza was intrigued by Minogue's cover photo in Australia's Who magazine as one of the 30 most beautiful people in the world, and offered her a role opposite action star Jean-Claude Van Damme in the film Street Fighter. The film was a success, earning 70 million in the US. By 1997, Kylie was in a relationship with the French photographer Stéphane Sednaoui, who encouraged her to develop her creativity. I think when Kylie started dating Stéphane Sednaoui, um, it, it, was, it was the time in her life where she really wanted to experiment. So he, he came along just at the right time. He was obviously a very artistic guy. He was very interested in Japanese arts and culture. Um, and she um, was, was guided by him to become more creative and experiment. Um, not necessarily, um, that didn't really produce hits necessarily for her. Um, but, but it was a time in her career when she was just exploring herself a bit and moving away from manufa manufactured pop. Inspired by a mutual appreciation of Japanese culture, they created a visual combination of geisha and magna superheroine for the photographs taken for her sixth album, Impossible Princess. The album was mostly a dance album. However, Kylie had to counter suggestions that she was trying to become an indie artist. Acknowledging that she had attempted to escape the perceptions of her that had developed during her early career, she commented that she was ready to forget the painful criticism and accept the past, embrace it, and use it. 
Stefan Sednoui collaborated with Kylie on her album, and you can really see some of the influences there. He they did a song together called German Bold Italic, where he actually directed the video, and it's one of Kylie's strangest videos. She's dressed up as a geisha in the middle of Times Square, and at the end, she's being led around with, uh, with a dog collar by some um, Japanese tourist or something. It's a very strange video, and she was trying to show something about the geisha and make a statement about potentially like women's enslavement to men or whatever she was doing, but it ends up really coming across as a bit odd. It's certainly not what people wanted to see from Kylie Minogue Pop Princess. And it's interesting because the album was actually titled Impossible Princess. And I think Kylie was trying to be more experimental and to say to people that it's impossible to be the pop princess all the time that you want me to be. He really taught her that she could do whatever she wanted. You know, she'd been this puppet of pop for quite a long time. It was like, right, you're gonna perm your hair, you're gonna be in those in that little cutesy outfit, be the girl next door. But Stefan was like, well, no, you can be a geisha girl. You can turn it around and have glitter everywhere. You can have feathers. You can, you know, start looking really overtly sexual. Um, and let's be honest, it was kind of the right person to just push her into that direction um, and just see what she was going to do. And I think we were all quite glad when she did start opening up that, that envelope. This album represents a departure for Kylie. She's trying to be more edgy. She's trying to take some risks. You know, critics who look back at Kylie's career are sort of unanimous in one thing, and they all say that she was a risk taker. She really tried to try new things and try new kinds of music. And although the public has really only embraced her in one way, which is as a pop disco princess, that's what people want from her, Kylie has not been afraid to try to express herself in other avenues. And I think Impossible Princess um, was one way. It's an unfortunate title, and in fact, after Princess Diana's untimely death, they actually changed the name of the album back to Kylie Minogue because it was a, it was a bit controversial as a title. Everything about this project, though, um, was doomed in terms of critical appeal. It did spend 35 weeks on the chart in Australia, but you have to remember in Australia, Kylie could do no wrong. Whatever Kylie did, she could sing the phone book, was going to end up on the charts in Australia. But around the world, this project was not really embraced, either in Europe or in, in the US. People didn't want this expression of Kylie Minogue. They wanted their little perfect princess put back in her box. The music video for Did It Again paid homage to her earlier incarnations. The album was a huge hit in Australia, where it spent 35 weeks on the album chart. So in the music video for Did It Again, um, Kylie's sort of experimenting with all her different personas. You see her in front of a kind of usual suspect's backdrop, like you'd see in a prison. And um, she, there's kind of cute Kylie, indie Kylie, sexy Kylie, and they're all kind of pushing each other out the way and singing a few lines. Um, and she's obviously um, looking at herself there and all the different guises that she's been um, and, sh and showing her fans that she recognizes she's gone through lots of transitions in her career. We had mischievous Kylie, we had indie Kylie, we had cute Kylie, we had a lot of Kylies. And I think what she was trying to show was, was that she's a lot of people inside there. You know, we all thought we knew her, but she was looking minxy. You know, this was a girl that was ready to wear hot pants, heels, and looked like she was uh, going out in the town and she wasn't going to come back till dawn. And it's like almost being hit over the head with a hammer for the audience to understand that there's more than one facet to me. Don't put me in this little box. I can be many things in my music and in my art. And, and in different costumes and with different hair and makeup, she's trying to make the point that all of those sides of her exist together. The song itself is not really a great song. It's certainly not one of her big hits. But I think if you look at all the messages that tr Kylie's trying to convey in this song, it's very clear what she's trying to say. In the year 2000, Kylie parted ways with Deconstruction Records and signed with Parlophone Records. Parlophone wanted to re-establish Kylie as the pop artist they felt she essentially was, but that had been lost. In September 2000, Kylie released her seventh studio album, Light Years. 
The album was a collection of dance songs influenced by disco music. It generated strong reviews and was successful throughout Australia, Asia, Europe, and New Zealand. The lead single, Spinning Around, became her first number one in the UK in 10 years. When Kylie made the album Light Years and the song Spinning Around was released, this heralded really the big comeback for Kylie. She had gone off in a different direction, trying to show different sides of her artistic personality, and it hadn't really been widely well received. By making Spinning Around, she gave the public what they wanted, which was a very sexed up version of their sweet pop princess. What you see in the video for Spinning Around is a very sexual Kylie. She's showing off her body from literally every angle. I think for the fans, Light Years was one of those uh, fantastic moments because it was really centered at the gay market. It was, you know, the gay men loved it. It was perfect. There was a video that made it completely mainstream where we had that infamous video with her in gold hot pants as she was spinning across the bar. Everyone was talking about her backside across the world. I remember when I first saw it and thought, wow, she looks amazing, wearing those gold hot pants, writhing around on the top of a bar. I mean, absolutely phenomenal. And that bomb, wow. I mean, especially given, you know, she, she wasn't a spring chicken anymore, but she, she looked absolutely phenomenal. And um, that poppy sound, you know, she'd managed to sort of fuse the, the, the sort of early pop Kylie with this more mature, sexy vixen um, in, in an amazing way, and no wonder it was a smash hit. She looks incredible, she looks amazing, but throughout this very graphic display in some ways, there's an innocence and a sweetness. You know, Kylie has been compared many times to Marilyn Monroe, and I think what they have in common is that even when they're being sexy and provocative, there's still something very innocent and sweet about the image that they're putting across. And that really shines through in spinning around. You know, Kylie is in incredible shape in this video. She's wearing tiny, tiny costumes. She's dancing provocatively. And this is really one of the first times we've seen her shot from below the waist in some of these outfits. This is far, by far her sexiest video to date. It became unsurprisingly an international sensation and really launched, relaunched Kylie back into the stratosphere. There were a lot of people, like particularly in the US, who didn't really know who Kylie Minogue was. But when this song came out, despite the fact that she had been famous now for like a decade, when this song came out, they were for the first time introduced to the global superstar that she was. And it also featured a couple of songs. She'd uh, done one with Robbie Williams, which he'd sung on as well, for Your Disco Needs You. And I think uh, as a whole, Light Years was classic pop. You know, it went into every bracket. It was one of those albums that was always on in the background. Um, and I think she'll still look back at that and be very proud of it. At the 2000 Sydney Olympics closing ceremony, Kylie performed ABBA's Dancing Queen and her single On A Night Like This. She then embarked on the On A Night Like This tour, which played to sell out crowds in Australia and the UK. The tour incorporated burlesque and theatre, and was also influenced by Fred Astaire musicals of the 1930s. She was praised for her new material, and her reinterpretation of some of her greatest successes. In October 2001, Kylie released her eighth studio album, Fever. The album contained disco elements, combined with 1980s electropop and synthpop. It reached number one in Australia, the UK, and throughout Europe, eventually achieving worldwide sales in excess of 8 million. The album's lead single, Can't Get You Out of My Head, became the biggest success of her career to date, reaching number one in more than 40 countries and selling over 5 million copies. And this album had a lot of disco influences. It was kind of heavier on the disco than the pop. This album really uh, cemented her place as a gay icon and was repeated again and again in, in nightclubs and gay clubs as well. 
and she really started to build her gay fan base with this album. Her song, Can't Get You Out of My Head, somebody once told me was David Beckham's favorite music video ever, and it's really no surprise. Kylie looks incredible in the video. She shows off incredible legs, and she was becoming increasingly famous for her little bottom. Before Kim Kardashian, before Nicki Minaj, there was Kylie Minogue, and Kylie's bottom was the subject of a great deal of admiration from men and women around the world. You know, it felt really far, very forward thinking. It felt like it was very futuristic. It was fe featuring a really, you know, brilliant hooded kind of dance moves, everything like that, the robots. Really high production values. Um, it's all kind of space agey, set in the future. She's driving along in an amazing looking yellow car at the beginning, and everybody is dressed in spacey costumes. And then, arguably, um, when it gets going, she's wearing one of the most sexy outfits you've ever seen her in, where her boobs are kind of almost exposed. Um, and she's it's kind of a white outfit with with a with a sort of white headdress on it. <laughs> Can't Get You Out My Head was a, an instant classic, and I think that's why it worked. Amazing song written by Kathy, Kathy Dennis, um, and just a perfect opportunity for Kylie to just take advantage and use every aspect of that song to leap her around the world. Following extensive airplay by American Radio, Capitol Records released the song and the album Fever in the US in 2002. The album debuted in the Billboard 200 Albums chart at number three, and Can't Get You Out of My Head reached number seven on the Hot 100. At this point, Kylie had established a presence in the mainstream North American market, particularly in the club scene. The song, which was voted all over the world as the uh, catchiest song, the, the song you literally could not get out of your head, um, in numerous poll after poll. Everyone loved the song, it was heard, it got a lot of radio play, particularly in the United States, and it really cemented Kylie's uh, position at the top. There had been a lot of talk about whether she could break America, but it's not quite easy. You have to put your time in there, you have to go out, you have to do all the clubs, all the live stuff, and you have to really work to get fans. She was Kylie Minogue, she was massive in Europe and Australia, but this was a moment where the right song created the right buzz, can't get you out of my head, opened so many doors to North America. She eventually ended up going out there with the Feeder album and touring. Um, and it was, it was great to see because it was clearly something for somebody so, uh, you know, not desperate, but you know, she, she had a real work ethic and she wanted to crack every part of the world. It was a real moment where she could go, oh, finally I've got in there. It was around the time of Fever that Kylie started to be called Pop Princess. You know, Madonna has been long seen as the queen of pop, but it was around the time of Fever that Kylie started getting the moniker Pop Princess, and it really kind of stuck after that. You know, whereas Madonna can often come across as quite full of herself and even humorless, Kylie always came across as happy, as joyful, as having a lot of fun. And I think that really resonated with people, and particularly her gay fan base, which fell madly in love with her after Fever. In 2003, she received a Grammy nomination for Best Dance Recording for Love at First Sight, and the following year won the same award for Come Into My World. It seemed nothing could stop Kylie from releasing a new album every few years. In November 2003, she released her ninth studio album, Body Language. The sales of the album were lower than anticipated after the success of Fever, though the first single, Slow, was a number one hit in the UK and Australia, and also reached number one on the club chart in the US. And it received a Grammy Award nomination in the Best Dance Recording category. In March 2005, Kylie commenced her showgirl The Greatest Hits tour. After performing in Europe, she traveled to Melbourne, where she was diagnosed with breast cancer. It was a shock to her. She was a very, very healthy young woman. She certainly did not anticipate this diagnosis and uh, subsequently was forced to cancel her tour. 
She sought treatment originally, initially in Australia, and then later she moved to Paris, where she underwent chemotherapy in Paris. Um, Kylie was a fighter from the very beginning, and she was determined not only to beat cancer, but to get back on stage. There were a lot of people at the time who were encouraging Kylie to take a significant amount of time off. But William Baker, a longtime collaborator who knows Kylie probably as well or better than anyone, said at the time that, you know, some people are gonna recover better resting, some people are going to recover better on stage. Kylie was the latter. Kylie was the kind of person who got energy from the love of her fans and from performing. Remember, Kylie is someone who'd been performing since the age of 11. It was like second nature to her. So taking such a long break out of the public eye and off stage was actually hard for her. And she was working towards the day when she could get back in front of the people and the cameras. During the early months of 2006, the media began reporting Kylie's upcoming projects and general improvement in her health. Kylie resumed the Showgirls The Greatest Hits tour in November 2006 with a performance in Sydney. Her dance routines had been reworked to accommodate her medical condition, and slower costume changes and longer breaks were introduced between sections of the show to conserve her strength. The media reported that Kylie performed energetically, with the Sydney Morning Herald describing the show as an extravaganza and nothing less than a triumph. She, she battled the whole thing with such dignity um, and um, it's been said that her having breast cancer has really encouraged younger women to go for more tests um, and it's really w raised awareness and she's done a lot for breast cancer charities um, since then as well. In November 2007, Kylie Minogue released her 10th studio album and much discussed comeback album titled X. X and the lead single, Two Hearts, entered at number one on the Australian Albums and Singles chart respectively. In the UK, X initially attracted lukewarm sales, although its commercial performance eventually improved. This was an, uh, kind of an electro-pop album, which Kylie put out there to kind of herald her return into the public eye. It was criticized at the time by reviewers uh, because of the fact that it didn't address at all what she'd been through the past year and two previously. It, there was no reference to the cancer. There was no reference to overcoming cancer. It was a pure pop album that didn't really resonate with anything that people knew that she had been through. I think X was one of those moments in Kylie's career where we're all a bit like, oh, we were expecting so much more. Um, you know, you've got to look at it like this. When she's at her best, there's heartache or there's you know, problems behind the scenes. So I guess we all thought, okay, she's been going through cancer, she's gonna really come back fighting. It just didn't really react with fans that well. It was fine, it was so good to have her back. I think everybody was really behind her, but it wasn't light years. It wasn't a can't get you out of my head moment. Um, it was the album that was just the in-between greatness. Because she's such a public persona, I think people wanted Kylie to express something about what it was like to go through breast cancer and, and come out of it. But instead, Kylie went back to what Kylie does best, which is put a very light-hearted uh, spin on pop music. Uh, so she was uh, criticized, but at the same time, you know, this is what she wanted to say. Maybe she didn't want to dwell on that very difficult time period, and you can't really blame her. The album X didn't do incredibly well. It did well in Australia, as all of her albums do, but in the UK and in the US, there was a very lukewarm response. In May 2008, Kylie embarked on the European leg of the Kylie X 2008 tour, which was her most expensive tour to date, with production costs of $10 million. In September of that year, she made her Middle East debut as the headline act at the opening of Atlantis The Palm, an exclusive hotel resort in Dubai. And from November, she continued her Kylie X 2008 tour, taking the show to cities across South America, Asia, and Australia. The tour visited 21 countries and was considered a huge success, with ticket sales estimated at $70 million. Coming off of her major tour in 2008, Kylie began another very high-profile romance with a very handsome and much younger Spanish model called Andres Velencoso. Kylie and Andres had a very um, 
seemed to be a very romantic courtship. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, she's dating this guy that she met uh, through work, through mutual friends. Very little was known about him, but he was very tall, very handsome, very dashing, and made no secret of his desire to protect her. Uh, between 2000 and 2000, 2008 and 2013, Kylie and Andres appeared to be very happy. There were never any rumors of problems. There were never any um, cheating, any kind of cheating rumors, anything like that. They seemed to be a very happy, loving couple and Andres appeared to be making her a very happy woman. It, we, you know, as we were all thinking, oh, it's gonna finally work, and she's finally gonna get up the aisle and, you know, hopefully um, settle down and have some sort of children, it just, it just faded like all the rest. Some people will speculate, and the, the reports that came out said that it was because of her work ethic and the fact that she's never really gonna be able to go, I'm not touring anymore, I'm gonna stay at home and become a mum or, you know, settle down. That's not part of her life, you know, she's worked really hard for where she's got and I think that might have, looking outside, looking in, always meant that the guy comes second to what her job is. Their split in 2013 was not a shock to those who followed the couple, however, because they had not been seen together for some time before. I think with a lot of very high profile romances, when you have two people who are in a similar field, both trying to achieve their career ambitions, it's very difficult to find the time to make a relationship work and just be in the same place at the same time. And I think for a lot of couples, like a lot of couples, Kylie and Andres struggled with this. In July 2010, Kylie Minogue released her 11th studio album, Aphrodite. The album received favorable reviews from critics and it debuted at number one in the UK, exactly 22 years after her first number one in the UK. The album's lead single, All the Lovers, was a success, and it became her 33rd top 10 single in the UK. So in All the Lovers, another very sexy video from Kylie, where um, there are just piles and piles of bodies all lying on the top of each other, really, um, writhing around sexily. The video was sensational as well. It was shot in America, and it had all the people coming up on, you know, getting to the top, and Kylie was there, everyone swaying. <laughs> really cements herself as this very modern Aphrodite, which of course is the name of the album. Uh, she's being push, held up by a swarm of people who all appear to be having sex with each other. And only Kylie Minogue could make an outdoor orgy look wholesome. It's the strangest thing. You've got all these people who do men and women, women and women, men and men, who appear to be just about to get it on. And yet, maybe because they're all in white underwear, or maybe it's just Kylie's face and personality, but there's some Something about it that doesn't feel tawdry in the slightest. Only Kylie Minogue could pull that off. When you hear that song now, you just can't help but sing along. And I think it's become a real song that, in her live performances, we, we all look forward to. Um, it was a definite return to pop form for Kylie. Subsequent singles from the album Get Out of My Way, Better Than Today, and Put Your Hands Up failed to reach the top 10 of the UK singles chart, but they managed to top the Billboard Hot Dance Club Songs chart in the US. In 2012, Kylie began a year-long celebration for her 25 years in the music industry, which was often known as K25. The anniversary started with her embarking on the Anti-Tour, which featured B-sides, demos, and rarities from her music catalog. She then released the single Time Bomb in May, the greatest hits compilation album The Best of Kylie Minogue in June, and the single box set K25 Time Capsule in October. Along with this, she also performed at various events around the world, including Sydney Mardi Gras, Queen Elizabeth II's Diamond Jubilee concert, and BBC Proms in the Park London 2012. In January 2013, Kylie Minogue and her manager Terry Blamey, whom she had worked with since the start of her singing career, parted ways. The following month, she was signed to Jay-Z's Rock Nation for a management deal. This was Kylie reinventing herself yet again. I think Kylie has understood what a lot of 
uh, big stars do understand, which is that you have to keep moving, you have to keep changing. It's like a shark. If it stops and it stands still, it dies. And I think if you want to be relevant culturally, if you want to make a difference, you have to keep reinventing yourself. It's something that Kylie has learned from Madonna, and she's absolutely credited Madonna for some of what she's taken from her. But I think in terms of Kylie, she's always been a risk taker. Signing up with somebody like Jay-Z and his Rock Nation management was a way for Kylie to step out again and try something new. And of course, it did lead to her next album and collaborations with people like Pharrell Williams, who, again, would be a not typical person you would expect to collaborate with Kylie Minogue. But it's an attempt on Kylie's part again to show that she can do anything. In late 2013, she was hired as a coach for the third series of The Voice UK for one season. I think Kylie signing up for The Voice was, was quite a strange move in some ways, because obviously we've seen Danny on X Factor and she'd done really, really well. Uh, but this was Kylie, you know, Kylie was the pop princess that was still on stage, still selling out arenas and stadiums all over the world. Um, but she did well. She went on there and she gave, came across really great, personality came across. But what I did like is the way that she went in and said, one time, I'm going in for one season and then I'm out of here. You know, which is what uh, people afterwards have done, like Gwen Stefani in the States. I think that's kind of important. It's good to kind of dip your toe in when it comes to those shows, but Kylie doesn't want to get, you know, pushed into a corner as that judge from The Voice, and quite rightly. So when Kylie was on The Voice, she was actually um, main cover of OK Magazine, um, and um, our readers really responded well to her and wanted to read more about her. She went down really well, um, especially at the beginning. I think the, the figures jumped up about two million um, on, on, the, on the year before. And um, I think one of the things people liked about her was that um, she was a bit more emotional than Jessie J. She replaced Jessie J, who did the first two seasons. And um, you know, she actually cried a couple of times when contestants came on and sang emotional songs, which went down really well with the UK audience. Following her success on The Voice UK, in November 2013, Kylie was hired as a coach for the third season of The Voice Australia. In March 2014, Kylie Minogue released her 12th studio album, Kiss Me Once. The album peaked at number one in Australia and number two in the UK. The singles, Into the Blue and I Was Gonna Cancel, did not chart inside the top 10 of the UK singles chart, peaking at number 12 and number 59. Well, in the video I was going to cancel, which is also off of her album Kiss Me Once, Kylie's actually directing pedestrian traffic. You see her with a white screen behind her and all these people kind of wandering through back and forth, and Kylie's telling them all where to go. I was going to cancel, then I thought about the strength that I got The, the thinking behind the song and the video was that people go through their everyday activities, boring, normal activities without thinking, and actually there's a way to elevate this very mundane behavior. But to be honest, it doesn't necessarily come across in the video. It's, it's a little bit strange. This is the song that Kylie did with Pharrell Williams, and I think again it's Kylie pushing the envelope and trying to be uh, different, trying to do something new. Uh, some people really loved it, some people really didn't love it. It was one of those things that was either, uh, was really went one way or the other. Kylie Minogue has had a career that can only be described as remarkable. Since her debut single, Locomotion, she has propelled herself to the top of the music industry with countless number one albums and hits. I think Kylie's legacy is that you don't need to take yourself terribly seriously and you don't need to suffer through your art. Art can still be art and it can be pleasant and interesting and provocative and also happy. Kylie Minogue has never strayed away from her fundamental uh, core persona, despite all the inventions and reinventions that she's done. Fundamentally, she's a happy person. Fundamentally, she smiles and she brings joy to a lot of people and she's never tried to shy away from that. Kylie's always going to be our princess of pop. You know, Madonna's obviously the queen, but Kylie is not far behind. And what's really exciting about her, I think, for all of the fans and for the press and for everybody else that knows her, is um, she has got so much life left in her. You know, just when you think, oh, maybe Kylie's going to take a few years out, she comes back with a pop belter. 
Um, the live shows are still up to scratch, they're still pushing boundaries, and I think we're all sitting there waiting for the next phase. You know, Kylie was uh, soundly criticized when she made her first album following her breast cancer for not for making it too trivial and not addressing her battle with cancer. But you know, I think what those people fail to understand is that that's not who Kylie Minogue is. Kylie Minogue feels, I believe, that her role is to make people happy, to get people on the dance floor, and to make people smile. And throughout her entire career, that's what she's done. And that's what I believe she will continue to do. Well, Kylie recently said that she would like to have children. Obviously, her sister, Danny has had a child. She's got a nephew now, and she absolutely adores. And she, ha she did recently say, though, that she's beginning to accept that, um, that having children might not be on the cards for her. She doesn't seem to have found anyone that she wants to settle down with. Um, so she might be sort of ruling that out. I do think she'll carry on making music, and I do think that she'll carry on experimenting and um, trying to work with new collaborations, whether she'll achieve anything like the success of Can't you Get You Out of My Head Again, who knows. She has passed every obstacle that's been put in front of her with a burning desire to come out on top. She is Australia's queen of pop. She is Kylie Minogue.